Trail back. <laughs> All right. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. I am Nicole Gallucci, and I am currently in a very noisy coffee shop in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm here for my graduation this weekend. Um, so uh, since I'm on tra travel, I will be uh, doing the production from the background, but I have with me uh, two lovely co-hosts. I have David Dickinson. Hey. Hello. And uh, Matthew Francis. And so they have a host of stories that uh, we are going to be talking about. Uh, continue to send your comments in all the usual places on YouTube, on Google Plus, um, on uh, use the hashtag Space Hangout, and I will get those questions in um, and keep sharing the links out, but you won't be hearing much from me this week. Um, but we have some stories about major moon impacts, about um, the Kepler space mission, of course, is, is uh, currently having a little bit of trouble and uh, solar activity, and I may give a quick spoiler-free uh, review of Star Trek, the movie, the second yeah, say, we're, movie. We're, we're the only science writers that currently aren't watching Star Trek right now, I think. Exactly. It's because I already saw it. I'm going again tonight. But, um, David, why don't you... <laughs> I'm going again. I'm in costume. David, why don't you take it away, um, okay. and, and Matthew... Uh, Go ahead. So maybe start with the Moon Crater one. I'm, I'm interested to hear about I this can, one. I can start on that. Yeah, that came around last night, and it was very interesting. It came around on Twitter. Uh, NASA released uh, one of their science videos. Was uh, They were talking about that they had seen, uh, they have a survey that goes on of the Marshall Space Flight Center out of the, the Meteoroid Impact Environment Office that they're watching and, and continuously videoing the moon whenever they can for impacts. And it turned out on March 17th, they saw a fairly large-sized boulder-type impact on the moon that was about fourth magnitude, which means that if you were looking at the moon at that time, you would have seen it. The moon at that time, the first thing I saw that, I started scrambling to see what the phase and the viewing visibility of the moon was. The moon was about the same phase it is right now. The moon reaches first quarter tomorrow. At that time on March 17th, it was a few days prior to first quarter. It was a waxing crescent. And this impact was in the mirror of Imbrium on the moon. So it was on the nighttime side, but the earthward facing side. You know, people always mistake the far side and the night side of the moon. Sometimes the night side of the moon is actually facing toward Earth during a new moon, during an eclipse and things like that. So uh, and it was kind of funny last night when I saw the video, when I saw the tweet come around, I misunderstood a friend of mine. I thought he said Mar May 17th instead of March. So I thought he's over in UK. I thought he means there's an impact going on right now. So I scrambled and got my binoculars and ran out and took a quick look at the moon just to see if there was something going on uh, amiss, like we had a really large impact going on. Then I came back and read his email again. It's like, oh, okay, it said March. So then I started, we started combing through Flickr pages last night, looking at people's photos. And incidentally, I emailed Bill Cook at Marshall Space Flight Center and asked him about the exact time uh, because it wasn't really clear when this occurred. He said it was at 3.50.55 UTC on March 17th. So that would have been that would have been early in the morning, late at night. It would have been about 11, not quite 11 o'clock at night for the East Coast. And I looked at the visibility. The visibility would have been over the Pacific Rim region in the west coast of the United States. So if anyone was imaging the moon that night, and a lot of people were because it was very near Jupiter at the time. So a lot of people were imaging the moon. Uh, take a look at your photos. You might have caught this impact. It's quite possible. Is that what Matthew, what is Matthew showing? I, I think I know. Yeah, that's, oh, that, that's the sequence. Yeah, that's the sequence yeah. of, of photos from NASA yeah. um, released. I, I'm sorry for the low resolution. That's all I could find. But... Um, you can yeah. see that you can see that the explosion washes everything out while it's going. So and it was a pretty major impact. When when you watch the video too, it was it was only seconds long. It was pretty quick. Uh, but it was interesting that we don't get a lot of impacts. They watch the moon incidentally when there's a large shower like the Leonids or the Perseids or the Geminids. They have seen impacts of those micrometeorites on the dark side of the moon. If, it's, if the moon is at a favorable phase, naturally during full moon, you're not going to see a fourth magnitude impact. It, it wouldn't appear. But when the moon is at a crescent phase like that, especially when it's a waxing crescent because it's in the evening time, so a lot of people would have been watching it. I'd really be interested to see if a, there have been amateurs that have caught uh, flashes on the moon before, either visually or photographically. So it would be interesting to see. So can you maybe repeat that date and time again um, for any yeah. astrophotographers watching. It was on March 17, 2013 at 
350-55 UTC. That's right down to the second. So, uh, And, you know, I, I incidentally took a look at, at first. On March 17th, there was a virtual star party that night. Uh, however, so I got to thinking, I was like, I wonder if we had happened to be imaging the moon at the same time. So I watched back through the entire virtual star party from March 17th just to see until I found out, okay, UTC, it was actually the, set, the morning of Sunday the 17th. It wasn't the evening. But when we first saw the message go out, it wasn't clear if that was March 17th the evening or March 17th the morning. So I, I checked. I was like, that would have been very cool if we had caught the flash in the virtual star party, but it didn't occur. I'm always thinking of weird stuff like that. That would be a, that would be a VSP first. That would be a VSP first. Um, maybe speaking of activity, you have some stuff on some solar activity that's going on. Yeah, the the sun is finally starting to show. It's it's starting to look like it's actually going toward its maximum, like it's supposed to look like, because we're entering into the peak of solar cycle uh, 24, which is peaking the end of this year into the beginning of 2014. But the sun hasn't really been acting like it's going to peak. It's, it's been kind of a, a sputtering solar cycle where, had I not known, there's been a few times, like the last few weeks, where there almost were no sunspots. Now, the sun started getting active again this week, sent out several large uh, coronal mass ejections. None of them were earthward aimed. There's some talk that we might get a glancing glow from one on this coming Saturday night. And we haven't quite reached storm level on the, the, the estimated uh, KP index, which shows like how powerful the uh, auroras are supposed to be. But we made a run at it at about four, which is pretty respectable. So, And that sunspot group, incidentally, is earthward facing now. When it started throwing up flares uh, earlier this week, it was rotated off to the side. Had a very nice coronal, or, uh, solar flare prominence in hydrogen alpha. I'm looking at the sun every day in hydrogen alpha and in white light. I have two scopes. So there was one I had to video because it was a pretty amazing. When it's off on the side in profile, there was a large, about almost, I'd say, a fifth of the diameter of the sun. I actually called my wife out. I was like, you got to see this. We haven't had a flare like this for a couple of days, for a couple of years. So it was uh, pretty impressive. But hopefully we get some more solar activity, just no Carrington events. <laughs> No, I, I was looking out the window to see if the sun is out behind clouds here, but I don't think it is, unfortunately. I got blue skies today, but of course it's going to rain for graduation. So I, I was just looking an hour ago, and it's still pretty. It wasn't as active in hydrogen alpha, but it was pretty active in white light. There's about a dozen sunspot groups earthward facing now, all moderate size. There's one really large one that everybody's watching right now, but the the sun is being pretty active. The we don't quite understand why the sun was so inactive. Uh, through 2008, 2009, it was one of the most inactive periods we'd ever seen. And this solar cycle seems to be having a hard time getting started. There's a lot of theories out there in solar helio seismology as far as what is going on. There's even some theories out there that solar cycle 25 may, the one after this, may almost be non-existent. Like we're entering into a larger minimum out there in addition to the maximum. So we'll, we'll see. It's an interesting time to watch the sun. Um, the grinder's on, so maybe you guys can pick up. I need to mute myself. <laughs> uh, well, actually, uh, you had an annual eclipse video. I can share that link, but maybe um, we can move out in the solar system to Uranus and Neptune with Matthew. No. Okay. Um, well, this is this is a paper that just came out uh, this week. Um, it was based on actually. It's it's really funny how. Uh, we're still able to get new data, uh, get, well, I should say get new results from uh, Voyager 2 data after you know, so many years. But uh, there were some scientists who looked at uh, Voyager 2 data and Hubble Space Telescope data. And what they were trying to do is understand the structure of the atmospheres of Uranus and Neptune, um, which are... Uh, if, you, if you look at pictures of them, you'll notice that they don't have the big obvious storms that you see on Jupiter and Saturn. You know, Cassini has been taking pic great pictures showing how, how stormy Saturn is, and of course Jupiter, the storms are a lot more obvious. But Uranus and Neptune, um, the, the storms are a lot less obvious, partly because they don't have nearly as much cloud cover, but they have incredibly high winds. And so this uh, research effort was trying to understand uh, 
where are these where are these winds are they are they do they pierce deep into the atmosphere or are they confined to the upper levels and so what they found is they modeled uh, they modeled the atmospheres uh, based on the behavior of the gravity but the, based on if you have a storm that goes deep into the atmosphere, if you have winds that go deep into the atmosphere, it can actually change the rotation of the planet. Wow. Um, that's that's a big difference between you know a gaseous world like Uranus and Neptune versus a solid world like Earth. Um, although we do have an analogous situation on Earth, if you have a strong enough earthquake, it can affect the rotation of the Earth slightly. And so this is, so this is what they were doing is they were looking for the effect of these jet streams, um, which can travel you know, like six, 700, 800 miles per hour across the planet. Um, and they did not find a substantial change in the planet's rotation based on these winds, which means these winds are confined to a relatively thin layer of the atmosphere. And I don't know about you, but that kind of surprised me. Um, you know, you kind of think about, oh, well, you know, it, it, the, the structure of the planets, as far as we know, is you, know, you, have the, you have the atmosphere, and it gradually transitions into a dense, thick, your ocean of of water and methane and ammonia, um, it doesn't have a, a sur you don't have a clearly defined surface of the ocean like you do on Earth, and so as a result, you know, I was surprised. But of course, I'm not a planetary scientist. I'm I'm a you know I'm a cosmologist, but uh, you know, it, it's kind of interesting to think that these winds are actually you know a layer. You know, they're icing over a calm cake of still atmosphere. Um, Sorry, I'm hungry. Um, <laughs> a lot so, of food analogy. Yes, but uh, but I, you know it's it's I but it, again you know if I can you know this is something that's kind of frustrating too though of course is that we have only visited each of these planets once I was say, with Voyager yeah. two. There are no projected missions to either of these worlds, so we. These are planets in our own solar system, and we don't understand them that well. So we would, you know, it would be awesome if we could actually, you know, go and, and have an extended mission visiting like Cassini or like Galileo. Um, so, for what it's worth. I, I think scientists are afraid to send a probe to Uranus because people will make fun of them. So. Well, that, yeah, actually, we could talk about that, too. I, you, know, you notice I pronounce it Uranus, which, of course, Uranus. isn't very yeah. close to, it isn't very close to the Greek pronunciation either, but it's closer than Uranus, which is the way yeah. people tend to insist on pronouncing it. Yeah. So. Um, I think it would take about a decade to get out there to Neptune, just, just to look at New Horizons, just, I believe it's past the orbit of Neptune now, I think. Uh, or not. <laughs> I don't think it has yet. Yeah. Well, no, because Neptune, yeah, because it, it crosses Pluto's orbit. New Neptune and, and Pluto actually. Uh, well, Pluto's farther than Neptune second. again. Yeah, right now. Yeah. So. But, but I uh, don't think. But it, New Horizons has been going since 06, I believe, when it launched, January 06. Yes. So got uh, two was more before years. Before Pluto got demoted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was still a planet in those days. It was still and a planet. And we've got two years, and it's got to reach Pluto. You know, see, and it's going really fast, too. Yeah. yeah, that was one of the fastest launches ever from... Uh, it's not the fastest moving spacecraft relative to the sun, but I know it went from Earth... It passed the Earth's moon in 20 hours after launch, so that's very fast. Wow. Yeah. And, of course, that is a problem, too, is, you know, if you're going that fast and you want to settle into an orbit around Uranus or Neptune, you have to find a way to slow down. And that may be, that yeah that's an engineering challenge um, you know so you either have to go slow and take a very long time to reach the planet or you have to be moving really yeah. fast get there faster and then figure out how to break or do okay. a flyby in which case you've got you know you don't have that long to study it. Yeah. That's when your horizons is doing the two and and right. Gone. You we're know, gonna have about gonna we're gonna have about one week of very interesting activity with New Horizons, and then exactly. Hopefully, it's got something else to. I don't believe they found a potential like post target for it. I know Ice Hunters is trying to find one. 
Ice Hunters was trying to find one, but our amazing citizen scientists went through all the data we had, and so we don't have any new data to actually go through at the moment. Uh, I know that the ground-based telescope that was working on it, um, they have either haven't had time or haven't had um, telescope time, you know, allocated time to do it. But we don't have any any data at the moment. But that's the hope is to find a second target. So. So speaking of Neptune and Pluto, I've heard there was some thought that Neptune's largest moon, Triton, may resemble Pluto when we see it. That that they they may be very similar. I've heard stuff about that too. Although I believe Pluto has a slightly thicker atmosphere. Yeah. Although it's it's seasonal. And again, this is my memory, so yeah. we need yeah. uh, we need a Pluto scientist here. The the blurry Hubble photos look kind of orangey black too, like it, it may have a little coloration to it, which would be kind of cool. I hope it doesn't all, just look all ten pixels that are in there. All yeah. ten pixels. I hope it doesn't just look oh. like our moon or something like that. <laughs> well, if it did, that'd be an interesting thing too, because nobody yeah. expects that. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> we don't. You know, Nobody. Insert obvious Monty Python joke. Yeah, as well. Yeah. And there, there's a pretty good chance uh, New Horizons may find more moons. I, I would make a small bet it probably will find more moons when it goes by. Yeah, yeah I, I've, I've heard the similar things. There we go. Um, so th another big, big news item this week was Kepler spacecraft is in trouble. I think uh, none of us have too much more information that, than what you can find. Um, skimming some of the articles about it. I know Amy Shiratidal uh, had an article saying, yes, they've lost one of their four reaction wheels. Uh, another one had been down previously. With just two, they can't do the exoplanet science that they're trying right. to do. Um, however, it is already past its original mission time. It's been four years. Um, okay. So we've, we've gotten our money's worth and then some. Uh, however, there's other science that Kepler could be doing as well. I think you guys want to... Um, expand on so we got, that. We, we got uh, tests will be coming up in 2017. That's going to take the next level of planetary hunting. And there's that a few stands for that is the is Transiting it? Exoplanet Survey Satellite, I believe it is. But it's actually going to be doing. It's going to be looking for for planets as well. But it's going to be in low Earth orbit, and it's going to look. Whereas Kepler is looking off just in one direction in the area of Cygnus, Hercules, and Lyra. Tess will be able to do a much broader survey than what Kepler's doing right now. But the exoplanet hunt continues with many other techniques and telescopes, and there's one with a fantastic acronym that Matthew <laughs> has covered for us. Well, actually, it's a terrible acronym. It's, it's, oh, really? It's one of those. It's, it's, the acronym is BEER, like the beverage. But it's, it's, they, really were, they were really stretching hard on it because BEER stands for Beaming, let's see, oh crud, now I've got, a, I've got it, it's gone. It's a Beaming Ellipsoidal, uh, and then, uh, sorry, hang on a sec, let me pull up my story. Um, I, I, put, I read it, but I don't remember what it stands for. Yeah, it stands for, it. stands for, it stands for beaming ellipsoidal and reflection emission modulation. Okay. Oh yeah, of course. So it so it has no you know it, it, they had to very selectively pick which words are a part of the acronym. Um, this is what uh, the science writer Mary Roach would call please a pretty lame excuse for an acronym <laughs> scientists and experimenters. But um, and I am reading off my screen, so that's that was not memorized. But. Uh, uh, it, but beer is an interesting technique, even if they really stretch hard on the on the acronym, because what it is is that it's looking for very small fluctuations in light, based on if the companion to the star orbits close enough, it will make the star's motion wobble. Well. Uh, that has a, a Doppler effect, but it also has an effect from relativity called beaming, which is that the star's light will be brightened if the star is moving relatively towards us, and it will be fainter if it's moving relatively away from us. Well, this doesn't, this isn't confined to moving directly towards us or directly away from us. It, you know, if you're looking at the system from an angle, you'll still see some of this beaming effect. So it's not a very large effect unless things are moving close to the speed of light, but it is still noticeable if the stars are moving, you know, if the, if the companion object is close enough. And so, but then 
that alone isn't enough to tell you that there's a companion or it isn't enough to tell you much about the companion. So that's when the other two letters of the acronym come in. If, if the exoplanet is close enough, um, and this of course is, it, it's like most other methods, it's very strongly biased towards really massive exoplanets that are orbiting close in. So this is basically a method for hot Jupiters as we call them, which always brings to mind some kind of really cheesy photo. Um, it's like calendar hot Jupiters, but yeah. uh, um, but it's uh, uh, if if it's close enough, it will actually slightly, very slightly, uh, perturb the shape of the star. Instead of being spherical, it'll be very slightly ellipsoidal, um, and that means also a slight variation in light. Then there's the final letter of the acronym which is the reflection emission part. Um, when the star, the star will actually heat up a spot on the, the exoplanet so it's a little hotter than the rest of the planet. Well, that will heat up enough that it'll emit infrared light which will then uh, feed back into the star's spectrum. And so you've got three effects, all the, of which are very small, but all of which are very distinctive. Yeah. And so what they found with this particular exoplanet using the Beer method is they could measure the mass of the exoplanet, which is very hard to do, by the way. Yeah. Um, and they also found the uh, found evidence that the atmosphere of the the planet is rotating faster than the planet itself. Something called super rotation. Yeah. Um, and they can't they can't measure the exact speed, but they but the fact that the the hot spot on the planet is moving as the planet orbits. Um, and it's that close, that means the same side of the exoplanet faces its star just like the same side of the moon always faces Tidally Earth. Yeah. Tidally locked, yeah. yeah. Uh, but the hot spot is moving. The hot spot is getting smeared out as the, as the jet stream of the planet goes around. So it's a really interesting thing. And, and the fact that you, you can get this with observations, even though you can't see the planet, yeah, you know, you cannot see this planet. It's 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 too close. It's to its star, and the system is too far away. But you can tell that it's rotating, and you can measure its mass. So I thought that was a really interesting technique, and um, you know we should be seeing more good stuff using the beer ma uh, beer algorithm. And, and, and yes. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, it, it amazes me that they can even tease this kind of stuff out when you think about, I mean, those stars have to have sunspots like our sun. Right. So when you're doing transit, exoplanet transit surveys and things like that, that has to all be untangled from the other signal that's coming out of there. And stars are variable, too, and things like that. So it amazes me they can tease all those things out in addition to everything else that's going on. Right. Now, I, I'm, I'm impressed that they're using, real, I mean, when I think relativistic beaming, I think, you know, AGN, active galaxy jets, you know, electrons moving right. near the speed of light, like that then beaming is a huge effect. Um, but the fact that, that they're talking about these really tiny, tiny measurement methods, it's just showing how um, our exoplanet detection methods have improved it immensely. You know, exactly. It's, it's too bad they shelled. Planet. It's too bad they shelled terrestrial planet finder that was supposed to go up there, those proposed things. Yeah. I think if we're going to find any any kind of life out there, if we could get any kind of spectral measurements of different objects, that's probably where we're going to actually see things like interesting chemistry going on in our lifetime anyway. Yeah. So, all right, well, and go astronomers for naming something after the beer. Yes. If you've ever been to an astronomy conference, you know what that's like. <laughs> Um, David, you had um, news on upcoming, well, Chris Hadfield coming back from space on the Soyuz, and then uh, you've got uh, some upcoming launches. Yeah, Chris Hadfield, uh, the, the astronaut from the Canadian Space Agency and the former commander of the ISS, came back down to Earth earlier this week. I don't know if he made a million followers on Twitter. We were trying to get him up to that point. Uh, when he was oh my god, he should have at least a million. Are you kidding he, me? He's he, been tweeting he from at, space. Oh, he, he deserves it. You know, I, was, I, know, right? I don't know if any astronaut has hit a million followers yet, but he may be the first one. But he did a lot for, for NASA, for social outreach, for public outreach, for what was going on up there 
on the ISS. It was a very good documentary that the Nature of Things Canadian TV show did uh, online that you can watch about the man who tweeted from space. That was very much worth watching. Uh, he did. Uh, he beat me to the International Space Station and covered Space Odys Oddity. Uh, I was like, I told my wife, I was like, I even showed her the video. I was like, you got to see this. This is like, I thought of that years ago, but you know, that was kind of. Oh, cool. it was lovely. That's right. That only came out on Monday. I, I keep thinking that was last week. That was Monday. So it, it came out right before they just. They leaked it out Sunday with no fanfare, no mention of it. Right it before you came back. It was beautiful. Go if you haven't seen it. Go watch it. Um, it's very just, cool. Yeah. I, I don't know if David Bowie got a bump on iTunes because of that, but. <laughs> but. Uh, well, I think they should release his version on iTunes. Yeah. I, I wonder how many kids are like, I'd never heard that song before. <laughs> but. but uh, um. it, there was also an interesting launch out of China that was kind of unannounced that a bunch of us were following. We saw the NOTAM come out where they had the notice to airmen that China was possibly going to do a launch out of uh, one of their spaceports. And, you know, to this date, it's not really known if it was a military launch or if it was a atmospheric test, like the government was saying. But Hong Kong actually saw this launch. Uh, there were reports of a UFO as seen from Hong Kong Monday. And what it was was actually the second stage booster lighting and doing its fuel dump. You could actually, it looks like kind of a V shaped cone coming out of the sky of light. There, I thought that was interesting. There was that UFO uh, sighting that was definitely a, a launch out of China. China's been pretty active this year. Their, their space program, they're going back up to their Tiangong space station next month. They're doing another manned launch. So they're going to have, we're going to have two crewed space stations in orbit. For a brief period of time, they'll be up there for about a week. But this will be the second time they've sent a crew up to their station. It's a much smaller. It's about the size of a school bus uh, space station. It's not a big space station, but still kind of cool that somebody else has got that capability out there. And there, there were a few other Skylab, though, right? I mean, Skylab it, wasn't. Yeah, was maybe a little bigger. Skylab was an old um, Saturn booster that was hollowed out, I believe. Right. It so it was just a, one of the surplus boosters they had. Uh, they just celebrated 40 years of the launch of Skylab this week. Yeah, that's what made me think of it. That was one of the very first launches I watched as a kid. Not the launch of Skylab, which was unmanned, but one of the first crews that went up there with Alan Bean and uh, I think it was two or three astronauts that went up there. It was one of the very first launches I remember watching when I was like four years old. So, yeah, that's that's all coming up. And I remember when Skylab came down, the whole ruckus about that. That was uh, that was kind of interesting. Um it's strange to think probably by 2030 or so we'll see the ISS come down, which will be very bizarre. Uh, I hope it stays up there longer than that, but it's, uh, I know they want to keep it going until 2020 at least. So. Yeah, that is amazing to think about, all that infrastructure coming down in a blaze of fire. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's that movie coming out this fall where they blow it up. I saw the preview with Sandra Bullock. Yeah, I saw the preview. Yeah, that trailer was frightening. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of you, but I, I, I was like sweating through that trailer. From what I saw in Universe Today, they said they didn't consult with NASA on that video, so I don't know how uh, accurate it's, it's a shame they didn't, but it's a, I don't know if it's going to be like Apollo 18 all over again, or if it's, it, it might be a good movie. I'll probably go see it. Speaking of movies... Here's a segue. Here's a transition for you. you uh, so Star Trek, of course, officially goes uh, out, is officially out now uh, in the U.S. Um, I, I promise no spoilers. I kept myself spoiler-free before I saw it on Wednesday night. Uh, since I knew I'd be traveling, I made sure to see it on Wednesday night with my boyfriend. And uh, we're going to see it again tonight. So to um, give you some perspective, it is good enough that I'm happy to, to spend money to see it again this weekend. Um, there's been a lot of back and forth uh, from the reviews that I have seen about whether or not it's a true Trek movie and this and that, and whether or not it's serious and philosophical enough or if it's too much action. It's a gorgeous movie. Um, it's action-packed. You can definitely expect that. And as a Trek fan, not a long-time Trek fan, more of a recent Trek fan, but I have seen all the Star Trek, so I've got some cred. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. So if you like Star Trek, go see it. It's worth it. Um, there, was, there was no red matter in this one? There's no red matter? Well, the red matter wasn't that bad. Come on. <laughs> Compared to other things in Star Trek, red matter wasn't so No, it wasn't. Bad. It wasn't that bad. There are a lot of lens flares, though. They, they... Yes. 
it that wasn't as bad as like when they do a baryon scan or stuff like that. No. So, but, but the lens flares did make me cringe a lot. They did not learn from all the fans making fun of them. I, I almost wonder in CGI movies, like at what point they'll start taking the lens flares out. It's almost like we expect that right now because but people they're, they're, are used to seeing movies the way they were. It's it's not it's it's not necessary to the extent that. <laughs> They have been adding them in. It's, it's silly. It's silly. Um, you you the, know, between doing Star Trek and Star Wars, I'm really surprised that J.J. Abrams doesn't just have a nervous breakdown. That's true. That's true. That's a lot of fandom you have to deal with. Uh, it is. We're, we're it picky. Is. We are demanding. We want to see quality stuff. But I wouldn't I be surprised. It. I wouldn't be surprised if they call in like Trek historians just to keep the timeline and everything. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Benedict Cumberbatch was fantastic. Uh, Leonard Nimoy makes an appearance, which is which is great. Uh, so you know you're gonna have all your fun action packed, and I will not say anything about the plot because that would be mean. Um, but, but you know, if you're ever into it, go see it. I'm going in. I am going in my uh, original series science officer costume tonight. Oh, very cool. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be a good time. It'll be a good time. Um, did, we, did I miss anything? Do we have any other new pressing news from the week? Um, is, there was that time lapse of the annular eclipse. I don't know if we if it's possible yes. if it will oh. crash the internet to share it. I shared the link. I'm not okay. going to try and share it on public Wi-Fi. <laughs> it's uh, I I I had done so much about the eclipse. I didn't get to go see it, of course. So, I'll try to pull it up while we're talking. Yeah was uh, the annular eclipse that passed over Australia last week. I watched uh, it on the internet. So. Yeah, I did too. And uh, it's interesting that it, it was there were so many people in so many remote locations that were uh, watching it across Pacific and Australia that photos and videos really trickled in. Like even till uh, today, I'm still seeing new stuff. But there was one observer, uh, actually two, uh, Jeff Sims and Colin Lake and uh, Peter... Nancy actually was another. I think I got his name right. Was that was no? He did the soundtrack for it. Okay, but there was a video that they had done from Western Australia of the annular eclipse rising that was pretty remarkable when you watch the animation because uh, they actually caught the green flash on the limb of the eclipse as it was coming up. I had never seen that during an eclipse before, and it was pretty remarkable what they had done. They were out past Newman, Australia at a place that had one of the coolest names ever. It was called the Plutonic Gold Mine was the name of the area that they were in. They were out in the Great Sandy nice. Desert out in Western Australia. But they got some, the, the animation on video, on Vimeo, if you haven't seen it, it's, uh, I'm surprised it didn't go more viral than it did. I think it was because it came out so long after the eclipse that it, everybody was like, oh, it's old news. But it's, uh, it was a pretty amazing animation to watch. And you can see on the, the still frame, that they have up on the screen, they actually caught uh, Bailey's beads very early on where the moon was. You don't tend to see Bailey's beads as much during an annular eclipse because the moon is too small to cover the disk of the sun, but you do get it sometimes on that ingress, egress, uh, graze line right along the edge, and they did actually, when you look at it in slow motion, they did actually get some Bailey's beads in this eclipse. You know, I got the video up. If you want me to press play, I can try and see if it, <laughs> if it Faster. We won't be able to get the sound. Yeah, that's okay. This, what is this? What is an eclipse sound like? Like one hand. Well, it's, this has a soundtrack. They they had a, they they put a soundtrack. Oh, on I'm sure. It. Yeah. So, yeah. But it's uh, but they were right in the right position, right along the graze line where they could see it just as it was coming up. That the eclipse was rising at the same time as we looked. So they had to do a lot of careful planning to be in the right location for this. It, and and there was a fair amount of atmospheric distortion. Whoa, that's too loud on my end. I can barely hear it coming through yours. Yeah, well, it's yeah. I'm wearing my headphones, so oh, okay. it shouldn't be coming through yeah. to you. Yeah, and the and the sun looked very it, it was distorted so much from the atmosphere. It, it had a very much of, of an egg shape. Yeah, watch this when it comes yeah. up. They actually got the bottom of the limb up there on the eclipse when it came up over. It's uh, and then it it went right back out, out of the. Uh, annular phase. They had the annular phase only for a few minutes right there where they were. But it was like, that's pretty remarkable that they actually caught that. I'd never seen one that, I've seen one annular eclipse in 94 on Lake Erie. I've never seen a total solar yet. Um, I haven't seen either now. I'm 
I think by 2017. We'll 2017. Yeah. Yes, 2017. That'll be the big one for for U.S. viewers. Yeah. That's cool. So check yeah. out that video. I think I put a link to your story about it, so it must be. Yeah, the it's on Universe Today and it's on Vimeo. So yeah, that's a, that's a pretty remarkable sequence. Um, I, of course, talking about Star Trek, we get a bunch of comments all of a sudden, like, no spoilers, no spoilers, I promise. Um, <laughs> and Star Trek Two was the best Star Trek ever, says Michael Jobin. I assume by Star Trek Two you mean Wrath of Khan. That that movie is. <laughs> um, uh, Dan Bias asked if we talked about the hangout with Star Trek and the ISS. We did not, because unfortunately I was on a plane and I missed it. I, I didn't get to join in on that, no. Yeah, I know I they did one. See that. They did one with some of the actors from the movie, along with the, the ISS astronauts, which is cool, and I will have to go watch it. It was a Google Plus event, uh, so that is, of course, recorded on, on YouTube, like, like all events. Um, so I will, um, I didn't get to see it, but I will definitely have to check that out. So. Um, oh, and also, Guido Bibra gave us an update about Commander Hadfield's followers. He has 970,000 followers on Twitter. Oh, he's so, so close. He is 30, so so away go follow Commander Hadfield. But the Space Oddity video has 13 million views. Wow. So, people, that is getting out there. So. And only two of them were me, so that's somebody else is watching that. I, 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 don't think there's a, I don't think there's a day that's gone by since Sunday I haven't watched it once. Yeah, yeah. So that's he's done an amazing job getting that, you know, getting people excited about space flight, and that 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 is irreplaceable. So thank you, Commander Hadfield. You're awesome. Keep doing what you do. <laughs> okay. Um. So I think that is it. Thank you guys for watching. Thank you to Matthew and David for joining. Um. Thank you to Shenandoah Joe for caffeinating me. We live in Charlottesville. Please, pay, you know, come to this coffee shop. There you go. Um. Usually we're not supposed to show logos, but I think we'll be okay with that one. Yeah, they get us. <laughs> it's not, it's not a corporate, whatever. They're not going to see me. Um, so yeah, uh, that is your weekly space hangout for the week. Uh, sorry, we we're a little disjointed this week, uh, and uh, we have the virtual star party on Sunday night. I think uh, they are still get um, collecting your astrophotography. They're doing a little contest, uh, Fraser and Scott. So uh, go ahead and send in send in your astro photos to the virtual star party. Join them on Sunday night. Uh, Monday is usually the astronomy cast recording, but I don't know if Fraser will be back from Google I.O. by then. So uh, they're, check the astronomy, cage, pa astronomy they're, cast page. They're sliding the virtual star party back to 9 o'clock p.m., uh, yes. I noticed. Here. Right. So that's going to be in, in the a.m. for us people on the East Coast. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's because most of the guys, you yeah, know, if you have a telescope out. around the world and want to join and do other time zones, we are happy to do that. But right now, it's mostly West Coast guys. So, <laughs> yeah. sorry, sorry, David. I know that's okay. <laughs> if it's if it's clear, I'll stay up. I'll, One I'll, of our East Coast holdouts. I'll look like this. I'll have my headlight on up here. Yes, yes, yes. That's right. It's funny because now I'm like, oh yeah, I see you on Sunday, and there's yeah. no sunlight. Yeah, you only see me like like this in the dark. So with the head with the red light on. So. Yeah, so that's nine Pacific, midnight Eastern, midnight Eastern on Sunday. Yeah. Uh, possibly it's astronomy cast on Monday at noon, and then learning space uh, will be rolling around. Oh, uh, I think we're going to be talking about astro tourism, how to go see a solar eclipse uh, or lunar eclipse all around the world with Rick Feinberg of the American Astronomical Society. Oh, cool. He is a cool guy. So uh, that is Wednesday at four Pacific. Yes, I will be back home by then, so <laughs> I will not have to be in a coffee shop. Uh, so thank you guys for, for watching. Thank you guys for participating. Uh, and yeah, that's it for your Week in Space Hangout. Bye, everyone. Have a good weekend.